you should get out there and, and and do the press. I think it really helps with the with the Kickstarter momentum. It does sometimes, but then something like I did one, and this guy I'm talking to him, and it's like it's in a dingy, it's dingy room, and I'm watching a roach crawl up the wall. I'm talking to him like I can't do this, so I kind of I kind of stepped away from doing a lot of those Facebook live things. <laughs> Because, you know, and I look back and, oh, four people have watched it. And I wasted four hours of my night watching a roach crawl up this guy's wall. So I, um, I kind of backed away from it the last few times. But when you reached out, of course, I wanted to talk to you. But I also, um, I started thinking, yeah, it's probably time I get out there and put some FaceTime in front of people. Hey guys, uh, welcome to Inside Comics with uh, George McHale. Uh, today I'm super psyched. Uh, my guest is Martin Piero. Uh, Martin, uh, thank you for being on the show, man. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm so happy to finally we can connect and do this. Yeah. Uh, so you have a new Kickstarter out called Arthur, uh, The Legend Continues, and we'll get into that in a second. But uh, before we talk about that, I'd like to talk to you about uh, starting a publishing company and getting your book into Diamond. I know a lot of people are interested in that, and uh, and you've done it, and uh, I'm wondering if you can shed some light on that subject. Okay, well, I, I'll try to keep it as short and condensed as possible. It actually all ties into Arthur Legend Continues. Um, I had worked with a friend who we were going to publish a book, and I thought, well, it's, it's not quite ready yet, so I, I wrote something else based on, I used to work in television and film and stuff, and we had a, my ex-wife and I put together this TV pitch for King Arthur meets Mad Max in a post-apocalyptic future. And I decided, well, I'll turn that into a comic script, see what I can do with it to um, change it up considerably. And I went to publish it, uh, self-published, because I wanted to you know, kind of get that vibe for self-publishing back in 2008. And uh, so I came up with a, I, well, you have to have a company if you're going to publish it. You got to be a publisher. So I came up with Cosmic Times, which was named, I used to do it when I was 14 years old, 13 years old. I did a fanzine back when that was a thing, uh, before the internet, when you would, you know, go to go get photocopies made and staple it together and take it to comic shops. And we called it Cosmic Times. So I just figured, just carry the name over, you know, just... No, nobody remembers Cosmic Times from the 80s, but I do. So I called the company Cosmic Times. We, I put the book out. Um, back in the day, use digital webbing. You find your artist, put the book together. Uh, distributed at Megacon in 2009. I printed 100 copies and sold out. And I thought, that's it. Uh, this is what I need to do with my life. I need to publish comics. So that started me down this road of publishing. And of course, I thought the book was amazing because it sold out. So it must be amazing, right? So I, um, I, I, found, I, I did research on diamond distributors, how it works, and all, all that stuff. And the, there's a submission process. So I think, and I honestly think, looking at the website, it has not changed in the last 13 years. So you, you, you write your submission, you write your proposal to diamond, you offer, you offer them a discount, and you send them a PDF of the book. And then you promptly get a rejection letter, which is what I did. Uh, said, no, no, thank you. Your book's not good enough for us. So, but I had success in the underground, what I call the underground market, um, going to comic cons and selling books. So I grew the label. I hooked up with Zach Bassett, who's now my creative director. And he and I did our next series called Decisions. I put out more issues of Arthur and we were distributing at the local, not distributing. We were selling at a local level, comic cons, comic stores, free comic day, wherever we could go to sell a comic. <clears throat> Excuse me. So then um, I'm working with uh, this guy, Deli Del sorry, he goes by the name Mervyn McCoy is actually his um, artist's name. Mervyn McCoy, Nate Hill. They have a book called Giant Robot Warrior Maintenance Crew. And um, I think this book is amazing. I, I, we, we, work, we talk for like a year until I, we eventually agree to do it together. Um, so I put it out. And I said, and, and it was, it was huge at cons. So I took it to, again, this would be my third time submitting to diamond. Uh, and I submitted it to diamond using the same process you do on their website and it got rejected. Yeah. What do you know? So I, I've had three diamond rejections at this point. And then that year we went to New York comic con to decide I'm going to go broke. Um, if anybody who's ever been to New York comic con, who's not from that general area, it's highly expensive to get into New York, uh, to stay in New York. And even the booth at the con, I think was like $1,200. So it was a very expensive show to do. So we're there and then diamonds there, diamond comics distributors. They have a booth there. They think they do every year. They probably still do. Um, and this woman from diamond walks by and goes giant robot warrior maintenance. I remember I saw that on my desk. That's a great book. So we picked it up, right? I'm like, no, you didn't. You guys rejected me. And she goes, well, here's my email. 
give me a message, I'll get you in the catalog. So that's how it happened. It didn't happen through the normal submission process of I send a book in and I get that happy letter. Congratulations, you're in Diamond now. I got, uh, oh, uh, uh, her name was Kate. I can't recall her last name right now. But we're just walking by the booth and going, hey, I saw that in my office. And that was 2015. So since then, we have been Diamond Distributed. Um, I can go into the highs and lows of that if you want to. The um, I, of, I often say, so go ahead. Oh, I just I find that so interesting because um, a lot of people find the just submitting to publishers to be a very mysterious process. How do you get your book uh, picked up by a publisher? And I always tell them that it's like it's about making connections and meeting people in person. Try and go to New York Comic Con, talk to a decision maker there. These sorts of things, and and you'll find your book will be published uh, more likely by meeting an editor. Uh, having them connect with your project and having them like you a lot more like that's been my success uh, other than um, it, you know, if you just submit into like the black hole of the internet, a lot of times you hear nothing back. So <laughs> it's, yeah. it's interesting that being uh, picked up by a diamond is sounds like a similar process as kind of having that personal touch. It definitely is. There is um, the when I first started off, and these people still talk about the gatekeepers of comics, and that the gatekeepers are Diamond. The only way to get your books into into stores legitimately uh, is through Diamond uh, comic distributors. Still to this point, and it's uh, there's only since I've been working with Diamond, they've pared their staff down like twice. So there's just a small handful of people there that make those decisions, and um, sending a cold letter saying, "Here, please take my book," versus you know, going and pressing flesh and saying, hey, I'm Martin, I have a book. Would you like to please put it in your catalog? Uh, that's your best bet. Um, I will say this, if you only have one book, don't go to Diamond. I think part of what attracted, uh, what got us in was the fact that when she walked by our booth and saw Giant Robot Warrior Maintenance Crew, she saw it with eight other titles. So she knew that cooking up by Cosmic Times getting into the catalog, we at least were going to have content for him for a little while. Right. Yeah. I think they say that in the submission um, process is uh, you have to have, I think, like at least two or three titles to, to apply. Right. For sure. For sure. And I think I think that helped. Um, and like, like we, were, we were just saying, it's it's that personal touch. Uh, I, I had, like I said, I, I had submitted three times. Guys, I still have the actual letters come in the mail. They don't email them. They come in the mail. And the. Um, I still have, I think, two of them just as a souvenir of the rejection I got. But once you get in, you're in. But it's it's not it's not all sunshine and rainbows after that. Um, there's a company called Second Sight, and I remember uh, the editor from there, Bradley. Uh, he and I were were talking before he got into Diamond. He was just about to get in, and he asked me for advice. And my advice was, if you don't have twenty thousand dollars in the bank, don't do it. Because that's what uh, that's what happened to me. We got in, and I often say the worst thing that ever happens to me is success. Uh, we got in the catalog. Uh, orders started coming in. Um, printing was a little more difficult back then, back in 2015, 2016, than it is now. There's a lot more options. Of course, now we have a paper shortage. But besides that, there's a lot more options open to you now than there were back then. I had to print in Canada or I had to print... At these, there's only a few hubs that you can really print mass amounts of comics at at the time. And um, they want their money right away. So you have, to, you have to put all this money out for the books. And then, you know, Diamond's payment, I'm not, not saying anything about a Diamond, but Diamond's payment process is 30 days after the book ship, which is already, you know, 10 days after you've paid for it. And then it's, Diamond's 30 days is at 30 days, then you remind them to pay you. Be, they don't just pay. You have to, if you don't remind them, you're never going to get paid. And sometimes you have to do it twice. So 30 days ends up being 45, 60 days. So you're out several thousand dollars at a time. Then you're trying to produce new books, and you're if and doing it on credit cards is a horrible. Rec <laughs> don't do it if you're using credit cards because that's kind of what got got me in some trouble. And you just had all this money tied up because I didn't plan for success. And that's always my argument to anybody. If you don't, you have to. You have to. You want to be successful, but if you're not, if you don't plan to be successful, you're gonna. It's gonna fail. It's gonna blow up in your face, and that's kind of what happened to me around 2017, 2018. Uh, things just kind of imploded. So I'm, I'm still kind of in that build back process right now. I've been building back for about a year and a half now. Again, thanks to Kickstarter and other um, platforms, I'm able to 
kind of rebuild the brand and get the funds back together. The, um, so that, that's kind of where I sit right now. I, I had, I've had some success. We had some uh, books that sold really well in the catalog. Giant Robot Warrior Maintenance Screw was still our best-selling book, and that was back in 2015 or 2016. We put that one through the catalog. So, yeah, that's my story. Can you tell us a little bit about sourcing a printer um, to go along with Diamond? Because I know, like, my printing costs, um, like, doing independent shows and things like that can be quite high. And mm -hmm. uh, so I can't imagine being able to sell a book um, for four or five dollars through through Diamond to uh, and making a profit. Not with the printers that I've been using, like locally up here in Canada, because my order numbers aren't large enough. And that, that's the problem too. It's uh, it's gotten better, but it's always about economy of scale. The um, uh, I have I have a huge walk-in closet that is full of comics right now. My comics, not my collection. That's somewhere else. But my all the extra books I had to print to get that cost down. Uh, what it boils down to is Diamond wants, especially for smaller press, um, obviously Marvel, well not Marvel, but uh, Image and Dark Horse get a better rate than this. But for small guys like myself, Second Sight, Scout, and and guys like that, Diamond wants sixty percent off the top. And on a three ninety nine, that means you're only making a dollar forty nine a book. And that has to cover your talent, <laughs> your and then, and your printing costs, and also your shipping costs. Shipping is super expensive when you're shipping thousands of comics. You don't think about it, but that weight is a lot, uh, especially when you have to ship it to Diamond has four different distribution hubs. Um, back when I first started, I, there was only a handful of printers. There was a Quebecor, which became uh, transcontinental, I think, and that's up in Canada. But if you're not printing five, six thousand, they don't, they don't, you don't, they don't have the time of day for you. And even then, printing when I printed, I think five thousand, I only got the printing costs down to just below the dollar forty nine a book, where I was making maybe three or four cents per copy. Um, since since then, uh, obviously, Kablam has always been on the scene with digital printing. Other companies have come along. Uh, there's Rich Boy with um, Comic Impressions. Uh, uh, there's Mixum, who uh, it, it gives another option. And if you get to that that right scale. Uh, you can get you can get the price you want. Um, luckily, comic prices have gone up since I started doing comics. So, where three ninety nine was the high end comic, now four ninety nine is the high end comic. So now you're talking that you'll get a dollar ninety nine from Diamond. So if you can get your printing costs per issue down to a dollar fifty a book by printing, say fifteen hundred, you're gonna um, you, you stand to make a little bit of a profit. You, you, most of it will get eaten in shipping, unfortunately. But um, at least you're not losing money. And that's what happened to me um, about halfway through my original run through Diamond. I was losing, for every book I was selling, I was losing like 10, 20 cents. So it would be, it, you can write off as promotion for only so long until you're not making any money. Right. And I think for a lot of publishers, um, Kickstarter is becoming part of their business model. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if we can get into uh, Arthur, The Legend Continues. And can you tell me what, uh, this project is all about the um, well. First off, to address the Kickstarter thing, uh, every year for the last two years, I get together and have a small summit with uh, other creative guys, other um, indie publishers like Kevin Laporte from Inverse Press, and um, I actually run a Comic Con here in West Palm, so I hook up with uh, David Herringer, who runs the uh, Infinity Cons and in, in, up in North Florida, and we get together, we plan out our year, we talk about things, and the one thing we've talked about for the last two years is. Kickstarter being the almost the foundation of your business model in that uh, if a book costs, just hypothetically, say $5,000 to produce a single issue of a comic with covers, colors, lettering, uh, artist, and printing, and you can get 3000 out of a Kickstarter, you're already ahead when you get to the Diamond Catalog. So because then that, then that profit margin can be a little shorter. So that's why it's kind of become part of our business model. But we also look at it from a marketing standpoint, and most of the, you know, uh, part of the key to marketing is getting that core audience and moving them from platform to platform to platform. And that's what we're looking at, and um, I think everybody should be looking at, all comic people, publishers, big, small, scout, source point, everybody should be looking at um, the, larger, the larger scope of it all and what their ideal customer is, and then moving them through their platforms. We launched a Patreon um, 
just this month. It was supposed to launch next month, but I wanted to give it a test run this month um, to be kind of part of that part of that machine. You have your Patreon, you'll have your digital comics on uh, the Kindle now, which is also Comicsology, and then you'll have your your Kickstarter, and then you'll have your your Diamond Distribution and comic conventions. And instead of looking at all those as separate entities that you're trying to feed, we're trying to look at how to make that kind of um, an ecosystem to where you'll have your core audience that moves from platform to platform to platform. When they get back to that, what we call the zero platform, the starting point, hopefully that audience is bigger every time you push them through on each new project or each new comic. And um, it kind of takes the, the periodical aspect of comics uh, that used to be kind of the cornerstone of how comics worked away and you make each issue very important. And like you say, you take your you take your your ideal avatar, your ideal customer through that process for each book, and hopefully you can build your fan base with each pass bigger and bigger and bigger. And by with a Patreon and with uh, even just through regular social media, like I use TikTok and other things like that, or you're using, I'm sure this will end up on YouTube and whatnot. Uh, you're talking to your customers or your base, and um, th that as on a personal level, which is what kind of we're doing right now. And then that's kind of that z that zero point that we talked about, and then you build from there and you cycle them back through it. So that's that's kind of how I look at Kickstarter. A lot of a lot of creators look at it as the end all be all. Like there's some guys here in Florida. I think we mentioned before the thing that Florida has its own ecosystem of comics uh, down here because we're so separate from the rest of the country that um, they all kind of live in this Kickstarter world and that's their world. And it's great. You make, you'll make money and you can get your books out there. But uh, we're, we're trying to find that to be not the world. It's just, it's just part of the puzzle. So that's how we're approaching Kickstarter. And with Arthur, which is ironic that uh, that's actually how we started the company, publishing this book right here. It's got a 2009 uh, date on it. This is the original one, one of the few originals I have left from that original, from that first Megacon. Um, what had happened was we were we were starting out. Uh, it was actually last year. I was talking to my son, like, "What am I going to do?" You know, we were working on the good, the bad, and the prehistoric, the dinosaur and cowboy book. We had other projects, but like, I need something else to work on. What else? And he goes, "Well, why don't you bring back Arthur? The legend continues. Uh, it's the story of King Arthur's return to post-apocalyptic." That's hard to say to Khan, by the way. King yeah. Arthur's return to a post-apocalyptic England. It's a hard pitch because it's hard to say. The um, because the book did well, uh, it's a great high concept, you know, King Arthur in the future. It's fun and exciting. The um, so my son's like, why don't you why don't you do something with that? I'm like, ah, the book's so old. My my writing style's gotten better since then. Uh, you know, the the art style, it's what it was for two thousand nine and the indie scene. But he's like, and he's like, well, didn't you write a fourth issue? Like, no, I don't think I did. And it turns out I did. I forgot, and I had written a fourth script. And um, so I took that and tweaked it, and we're, I decided uh, let's let's start it again as a volume two, uh, for in, so, so you don't have to have read the first volume, uh, the, the original three issues that came out in two thousand nine and two thousand ten. Uh, to kind of launch this new Arthur story because I think it's a good concept and, and I like the script I wrote. But then we started thinking, well, maybe somebody wants to read those old books. Uh, and so the Kickstarter that it's actually not hasn't launched yet, doesn't launch until January 4th. We want to get through the holiday. And then on January 4th, uh, we're launching Arthur Legend Continues on Kickstarter. And it's going to be the original three issues reprinted exactly as they were originally printed, except they'll have our new cover dress and the new logo on it. And we're going to put them in a collector's box set. Um, yeah, so that's what we're going to do, kind of create like a little time bubble of uh, the very first project we did at Cosmic Times. And it's going to be one of our key projects in 2022. The Once we finish with the Kickstarter, we're probably going to collect it all into a trade paperback. And then when we launch the volume two, we'll, we'll distribute that trade paperback to comic stores as well. So... Uh, the comic book retailers will also be fed the same the same product ultimately down the road. Does that make sense? Did I ramble on way too much there? No, no. It's it sounds like a cool project. Can you tell me a little bit more, like specifically about like what happens in this comic book? Because uh, I like the idea of like Arthur and the post apocalyptic future. What happens? Who shows <laughs> up? What's going on? Well, in in the original, uh, well, in many of the, I mean, obviously, uh, in my research, there is no King Arthur, but the in the in the legends and the tellings, when he uh, at the end of at the end of the story, the original story, he goes off to Avalon to be healed, so one day he can return. It's it's kind of a Christ parallel they were writing at the time, so one day he could return and heal the land again as he did you know, in in, in the classic telling of the once and future king. Um, so our story goes five, 700 years and, and the, it, it sets, it starts in the past and then it jumps into our future where um, 
the world has collapsed. Uh, and it wasn't, uh, ironically, <laughs> we're, we're in that situation, not we're in a situation of collapse now, but a situation where other forces besides war and famine are what's causing conflict in the world, which is kind of weird. And that's the way we approached it, that the world collapsed, not because of any great war or any um, outside influence. We just, we just ate ourselves to death and destroyed, destroyed our own society. And so things collapsed and um, in, in, in a form of apocalypse. And so now human race is building itself back, back up. Um, the cities are all gone they, and they've kind of grown over again with vegetation as opposed to being that kind of that wasteland Mad Max. It's more of a, a foresty. Uh, it's set in London um, and everything's kind of grown over. Uh, and we've kind of human race has developed into tribes again where this tribe believes this, this one believes that. And there's one that believes in the legend of King Arthur. And one day the sword appears in a stone, like a stone grows out of the ground, the sword grows out of it. Like, well, they, this is a sign. And so this village forms around the sword and they have faith that Arthur is gonna come save them. And then uh, over, over the generations, he never shows up. And so they lose faith in, in King Arthur. And of course, once they lose faith, that's when the villains come in to seize their village and lo and behold, that's also when King Arthur returns. So our story has Arthur returning. Uh, once he pulls the sword from the stone, he, his mind becomes clear again, and he understands his purpose. It's kind of a way to, to, to get around you know, the time shift that how would Arthur even begin to comprehend the world he's in now? Well, it's the magic of the sword. And so he, he's back, and he lead, he's leading this village the small village that grows and grows over time uh, throughout the issues. He's going to pull um, warriors together who then become his knights. And uh, it just kind of recreates that whole legend of Camelot in a post-apocalyptic future with, with uh, mutated villains that are coming in. You know, obviously there's, there's current modern day, modern day weapons uh, that Arthur's having to face. And um, he faces the challenge of just trying to bring his people back together again under, uh, under civility. That that's kind of, you know, the, the chivalry and civility that, uh, you know, the might for right that they, the, from the Arthur legend is what he's trying to bring to this, um, to this future. So that's, it's, it gives me, it's a large, it's a lot of area to play in and I'm really enjoying writing in that world again. Awesome. It sounds super <laughs> cool. And, uh, so I've included a link to the Kickstarter in this video. Thank you. And, yeah, absolutely. And also, uh, anyone watching out there, um, check out Martin's, um, uh, Facebook and Instagram. He puts all like these like quick tips, uh, and I find them like s super interesting, super fun. So if you like content like this, um, where we're talking about how to make comic books, you're gonna like Martin's Facebook and Instagram. Oh, I've thanks, also man. included that in the description of this video. Martin Piro, cool. I want to thank you for being on Inside Comics, and uh, I'll catch you next time. Thanks, man.